Gospel according to John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I'm going away, and I'm coming to you. If you love me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Please make yourself a note today. Out of all the notes that you have to do, write a note to read Exodus chapter 1 today. Please do yourself a favor, read Exodus 1, and go ahead and reread Exodus 2. This story is a short read, and it's the backstory to why it is that baby Moses was floating in his little ark in the Nile River in the first place. As you reflect upon Exodus 1 and 2, listen to a real story of what genocide looks like. How genocide affects the planners, the executors, the victims, the executors' families, the victims' families, and all who are part of a nation or region where genocide takes place. Every one of those players are represented in this brilliantly written account of the early days of Moses. It truly is a backstory. And of those who worked behind the scenes in such a time as this ways to protect baby Moses, as they honored that sanctity of life. I love these stories of the hero midwives. You'll enjoy that story. There's a little humor in there, actually. Whom Pharaoh secretly came to and asked them to kill any male Hebrew baby who was born. Now, it's hard to believe that the king of Egypt was that dense about what happens in the birthing room. But the midwives seem to tell him a good tale about how fast Hebrew women give birth and how difficult it would be to smother the life of a baby before a Hebrew woman could see their little one for themselves. The midwives found a way to save lives in the midst. Saintly ways. Not so different from the stories we have heard from heroes in the days of the Holocaust in our own recent 20th century times. Moses had his own squadron of guardian angels who looked upon him with God lenses and said, he is fine. He is good. He's a keeper. Moses' own brave mother looked upon Moses as God looked upon creation, if you remember from Genesis chapter 1, and she said, this creation is good. And then she and her young daughter and the daughters and the maids of Pharaoh's own family all conspired to save the life of the one who would rescue a whole nation of people from bondage and genocide. It's a great story. Genocide was no stranger to planet Earth in the times that this story took place. 
empire after empire practice the annihilation of whole peoples. Genocide is no stranger to planet Earth today either. We have seen outright gen genocide in places like Rwanda and Germany. And we have seen silent genocide in any place where laws are made or fences are put up to keep a people where they need to be, where they cannot grow, where they cannot function. They need to be kept over there with the intent to silence or eventually snuff out that group of people. In 1948, the United Nations Genocide Convention defined genocide as any of five acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. These five acts were killing members of the group, causing them serious bodily or mental harm, imposing living conditions intend to destroy the group, preventing births, and forcibly transferring children out of the group. Victims are targeted because of their real or perceived membership of a group, not just randomly. People are targeted because of who they are. This week, <clears throat> we have witnessed, and moment by moment, I know I was watching the television when I left this morning, around 8 o'clock. We have witnessed the escalation and the conflict in the Middle East that's been going on for some time. There's a long, long story of how the players in Israel and in the Palestinian territories got to where they're floating today in the river. But you know, God loves long, long stories. God has been adoring this creation since the beginning of our time. The Spirit of God has hovered over the waters of creation since our time even began. God has lots of time and is ready to witness us taking good care of our neighbors instead of seeking their demise. And that spirit that still hovers over the chaos is there in such a time as this. In moments to intercede, as we prayed this morning, to encourage, to lift up, to comfort, to fill that gap when there are just no words in our deep, deep sigh. What Hamas did to Israel is horrific. They actually worked toward one of their main goals of existence, the annihilation of the Jewish state in Israel. And I'm not going to let this one go. Israel has kept the Palestinians right where they belong for some time now. I heard a Muslim resident of the Gaza Strip say that when you are born in Gaza, you are given a death sentence. When you are a baby in Gaza, you have a death sentence. There's no way out. And when those retaliatory rockets and when the tanks come plowing in, they're going to be aimed at a penned in people. It's always amazing to me when we talk about rules of war. I never understand rules of war. It just shouldn't be war. I understand about torturing. I do understand why they have some of the rules. But it's odd that there's rules to war. When you stop and think about it as hunting, hunting, 
hunting season starts in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, there are more humane rules for deer than there are in this situation that we have in the Middle East right now. There's no excuse for what Hamas did to Israel. The bloody terror attacks that, look, that took place but there's no excuse for leveling the communities of innocent people who have already been fenced in either. God weeps. God weeps. What is it that we're called to do in the midst of chaos? What can we do? I believe our brave Egyptian and Hebrew women in today's Exodus text provide a good answer. We love each other one relationship at a time. We see the people who we have contact with. We, as we have heard in our welcome statement today at St. Matthew, we seek to meet new people and new neighbors. And we reach out to them one relationship at a time. And I think there's something important to say about the things that we write, the things that we say, the things that we put on our social media. We need to be that positive force out there to show peace. We need the signs in the neighborhood we need the signs on our social media in all cases to bring about peace. I want to tell you about an organization that sits in the midst of the crossfire. It's a Lutheran organization. Augusta Victoria Hospital, ABH is a program of the Lutheran World Federated Department for World Service in Jerusalem. They're in the West Bank. That's another shining example of what to do in the midst. Augusta is in the middle of the war zone. They, like our players in the Exodus narrative, are finding ways to care for creation as they walk through the crossfire of competing armies. This is what I get in general information from their website that was probably posted previous to the conflict. Specialty departments that account for the majority of work at the hospital are the cancer center. And as I read this, it's going to sound not much different from LGH, but there's a sentence one paragraph away that I really want you to pay attention to. The Hematology and Bone Marrow Transplant Center, the Artificial Kidney Unit, Dialysis, the Surgical Care and Ear, Nose and Throat Center, the Diabetes Care Center, the Specialized Center for Child Care, and the Skilled Nursing and Long-Term Subacute Care Facility. These care centers provide specialized treatments that are not available in the majority of the hospitals in Palestine. The hospital is now focusing much of its strategic efforts on establishing a palliative care facility as well as a care center for the elderly. This approach is in line with the hospital's overall strategy to establish health services otherwise unavailable to the Palestinian community and complements the existing services at the hospital. The hospital is the first and only hospital to provide radiation therapy for cancer patients in the Palestinian territories. And it's the only medical facility in the West Bank offering pediatric kidney dialysis. On a daily basis, these and other specialty services touch countless lives, both young and old, from communities across the Palestinian territories. They are in the midst. They are like the 
Hebrew midwives. They are like Moses' mother and sister and Pharaoh's daughter. Today, as we celebrate our open and affirming status as a congregation, hopefully, we've accomplished some things and we've talked about this. And this is a part about the circles out in the fellowship hall. First, the acknowledgement that we don't always get things right. That's why we strive to learn more and more of the questions. We can't always see where our neighbors are penned in or shut out unless we see it firsthand or hear from them and empathize with them. Listening is vital to loving our neighbors. We provide a safe place, a sanctuary, when we openly announce that all are welcome, whether it's by putting it in print or by painting rainbow colored doors outside or by our attendance at pride festivals or by simply living it out. We are offering a place for people to live safely in the reeds along the Nile River. A safe place to be loved and cared for. A safe place where one can have a voice. We honor the Moseses who have lived through a great ordeal. And we honor the guardian angels who have nurtured the Moseses every step of the way. I could speak for hours and hours. We could have a whole separate service about the behind the scenes and the very public moments that allies have given of themselves to help me along the way and to help others along the way. As one who has been both nurtured and who has nurtured, I stand today in a unique position and I thank you, St. Matthew family, for your brave work. God smiles widely over the work that is done in this place and God says, this is good. So what are we to do in the midst of a changing world in which we live? I see so many people who are in transition. I do see chaos in this world. When we have a war going on on the other side of the world and our own House of Representatives can't get their act together to provide leadership, there's a problem there, folks. That is chaos. And it's selfish reasons, too. God help us. There are people experiencing new realities with their health and with mobility. There are businesses in our community that have operated in such a way, in an organized way, in a healthy, balanced manner over the decades, and they have new realities. There are pharmacies closing. There are grocery stores struggling. There are people changing church membership. It affects the whole community in all sorts of denominations. I call it the pew jumping. For whatever reason, there are people leaving St. Matthew. There are people coming new to St. Matthew. There are people who are attending church less frequently. There's a lot of trouble in our world, and it doesn't feel good right now. It's written on your faces, and I hear it in our conversations. I know you're concerned. Whatever circumstance we are in, we are called to love the Lord our God with all our heart. And what's the second part of that? Mind. Oh, yes, our mind. Good job. But who else are we called to love? Our neighbor as ourselves. 
God is always going to provide a place for us to be nurtured. Wherever that is, even in the reeds along the Nile. God is always going to provide a place for us to nurture others. I think of the folks who are fleeing Gaza today. And I think of the love that is being shown back and forth in the ways that people, I assume, are helping each other down the road. I can see the families in Jerusalem and other parts of Israel worried to death about their loved ones that are in the military. Worried about what rockets may come next. Worried about what is next. God will always be with us no matter where we are. Folks, God has it in control. The Spirit of God hovers over us. The Spirit of God will take care of things. You are loved. God loves you. God will take care of you. May the Spirit of God hover over our chaos and birth renewed goodness in all our relationships. Amen.